Well, hello everyone and welcome back to our closing for this uh, amazing Under One Sky 2022 conference that has in the last 24 hours gone to every corner of our planet. Uh, we've had speakers from 17 different countries or hosts. Uh, we've had more than 600 attendees. You know, it's, it's amazing that in this era of Zoom communication, this is the kind of gathering that was never possible uh, before the, you know, the advent of, of widespread Zoom and other kinds of communication like this. So we are welcoming all of you back for what will be our final session, our closing session. And so to get things rolling, I'd like to introduce for you uh, Ruskin Hartley, who is the executive director of the IDA. Ruskin? Well, thanks, Kelly. It is absolutely wonderful to be back. Uh, like some of you, I spent much of the last 24 hours just immersing myself in such incredible uh, rich content. I wanted to start off by just calling out a thank you again. Thank you to all of the staff at IDA who made this possible. I know if you can bring people's faces up, Betty Meyer, so they can at least wave at everyone. Uh, I particularly just wanted to acknowledge uh, Betty Meyer and Lauren and uh, uh, Michael, who've really done a lion's share of the work here, and our incredible volunteer, Paris, who came back and has been really manning all the social media, and Ashley and Pete and Susan. Uh, and Amber and everyone, just like it's a, it's a, an, I'm just so honored to work with all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, also, thank you for the session panel, uh, session hosts and the panel hosts, many of who are board members and members of our committees. You've done an incredible job. We couldn't have done this all without you. Um, thank you to all our presenters, and I'll get to that. But most of all, I wanted to thank all of the participants who have made this such a memorable uh, conference. Uh, we had about 1,500 people logging in, over about 650 or so unique individuals logging in uh, over the last 24 hours, participating in well over a 1,000 hours of discussion collectively. Um, now, as a geographer, um, we really have been on a dream journey over the past 24 hours. Um, we started in Santa Cruz, California with Lisa uh, 20, just over 24 hours ago. Um, what we what took us to Thailand, where we discussed the challenges of protecting dark skies against if you remember thousands of chrysanthemum farms, it turns out the solution was pretty simple. It was an but it was also innovative. It was a plant pot that they used to shield the growing lights. And what started small is now growing to be a network of national dark sky parks, incredible story. Uh, in Bangladesh, uh, Rubiat challenged us with provocative thought that light pollution is not pollution in Bangladesh. With so much air, water, noise pollution, so many other issues, his thesis was are really people prepared to take on another issue, the issue of light pollution. But with his work, Arubiat started to change that. We then traveled to Taiwan, where Axio uh, challenged us, I think, to extend dark sky protections to the dark ocean agenda and showed us how focusing on protecting dark skies can be a tool for international uh, cooperation, despite some very challenging times. Uh, we next moved to Nepal, where one of our award winners, Viraj, who is also based in Texas, showed us how the natural curiosity of children can be a powerful force for action. He's got kids across Nepal petitioning their government around light pollution and dark sky issues. And next, we touched down in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, where Patricia discussed how the directive to focus on turtles and protecting the stars overhead is really requiring lighting practitioners such as her to really rethink their work Think about how they can incorporate darkness into their designs from the very start. And like you, I'm going to show the rendering she showed just showed us just how beautiful these can be when these lighting designs are challenged to do their best work. Um, next, across, across the Atlantic to Aruba, a gyro uh, discussed how does a small, densely populated island with an economy that depends on an annual influx of two million visitors come together to protect its skies. That's the path that he set himself out on by establishing the Science and Nature Aruba Foundation. We wish him luck. We're here to support him. Next, we journeyed south to Chile, uh, across the mountains there, uh, uh, where Pedro discussed the decades of work that have gone in uh, to protecting, initially, the night skies above those incredible world-class observatories there, and how that, that has set the stage to continue and extend those protections across the country, protections that started with astronomy, um, biodiversity, uh, extended from astronomy, biodiversity into, into people. Uh, and we wish Pedro luck in the in the coming months as he tries to get ground groundbreaking norm enacted later this year. 
Uh, and Vedimai just texted me to say, can you mention closed captioning? So I can, <laughs> let me do that. Let me just mention, if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, you can click on the closed captioning. You can pull it up in English, or in fact, you can translate it into a number of other languages uh, if, if that helps. We hope really that helps you all follow along. Um, next, we journeyed north, up through the American continent to, in fact, the Navajo Nation. Uh, and Ravis, he took us on, I think, a really moving, a uh, very emotional journey that showed that seamlessly blended the past and the present and showed how deep the Navajo connection to the stars is and how it's an alive and a part of everyday life today. He also encouraged us to really understand our own stories and share our own stories and be mindful and respectful of other cultures and traditions. One of the things that really stood out to me this year was also the ability to travel in time. Valeri from the UK took us back millennia when the Milky Way was a part of everyday life, before we had washed out the stars with countless light bulbs here on Earth. You know, the Milky Way as a circle of stars being been depicted in art and culture from ancient times, uh, from Egypt, to times of Egypt, from Babylon stonework, through medieval manuscripts, through to contemporary art, and I think really challenge us to think about what does the lack of the stars, what does the lack of the Milky Way mean to our connection, our relationship to that, and how will that be expressed in art going forward? Uh, maybe it will be become more normal in art. You know, she was commenting at the end that people are wearing uh, stars on, 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 on fashion now, but it's now because it's unusual uh, that it's, it's starting to show up. And we'll soon, once I finish, we'll leave the surface of the planet and we'll head out uh, to near Earth orbit and actually journey into other realities with a wonderful closing panel. Uh, we've also had three really thought provoking workshops over the last 24 hours. Krem led a great discussion that put community at the center of dark sky conservation. Talking with Laya, Wayne, and Steve, he shared how communication, goodwill, and recognition can create the changes we need to see. Uh, sometimes it is literally as simple as changing out a light bulb, but then giving someone a stick and say, hey, I changed out a light bulb. Why don't you be like me? Do your part, protect the night sky. Uh, Dan Oakley um, in the UK in South Downs led a wonderful conversation on the different motivations for dark sky parks across the world. Sabine, Johan and Eleanor have worked on widely different successful applications in Germany, in South Africa and in Canada driven by biodiversity concerns, culture and heritage or urban communities. Um, you know, the, you know the, as, as Dan was commenting, uh, that there's not many things that can eat you in the South Downs National Park, but if you go down to the, one of those wonderful parks in, 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 in South Africa, in fact, they have to close it off a lot of the night so that they give the animals the freedom and the space that they need. Um, Dan encouraged everyone working on dark sky applications to really focus on the commitment Encourage people to don't hide from the threats, lean into them, figure out how to solve them, look for opportunities. And part of the conclusion of that panel is that dark skies has moved from the realm of astronomy to be a cross society issue, which is really exciting because that can, means it can involve more people. And Yana closed out, closed out the workshops with a thought provoking policy panel. We heard from Anna, Amy, and Diane the importance of realizing the people on the other side of the table. They're people too with lives and hopes and needs and, and motivations and really looking to build those relationships so you can understand where we're coming from and look for those areas where we can make common ground. Uh, and Anna discussed how regulators are looking to all of us, to all of you, to provide the current credible information they need to make informed decisions as they're looking at adopting, modifying and updating policies. Now, I want to go back to a quote that uh, Valerie, our art historian, shared with us that really struck me. And it's a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, and I'm sure it's known to many people here. And it starts off, if the stars should appear one night in a thousand years, how would men and women, how would people believe and adore? I think we go back to the start where Lisa, Lisa shared with us when we launched the conference that this is essentially the world we live in today. For most people, the stars do not appear every night. They will not appear one night in a thousand if you stay in a large urban city. You have to go out and find them. Lisa's opening address was also a clear call for dark, dark nights, but also bright, bright days and dim evenings. 
the evidence she presented is really clear. We cannot escape the fundamental rhythm of a planet. It is literally written into our DNA. And if we do try and escape it, we do so at our perils. So what can all of you do? I shared three opportunities when we kicked off and I just wanted to come back to those three things. So one is learn. We are all off to a great start. I feel like I have learned so much and it's gonna take me a long time to digest this. Fortunately, everything's been recorded. It's probably up on Facebook at the moment because that's how Facebook works, but we will uh, be taking all the recordings and we'll be uploading those to YouTube. So you can go back and use them as a resource for your learning and share those with your communities. The second was act. Hopefully you have identified some ideas that you can take forward in your community to start to make a difference. IDA is committed to supporting you in this area, helping you act and make a difference. Now, one thing you can do if you haven't already is join the Dark Sky Network. Details will be coming soon. We're sharing that. Join our incredible advocacy network. Rub arms with the uh, rub shoulders of the incredible individuals you've heard over the last 24 hours. And over the coming months, we'll be working together to build Dark Sky momentum by focusing on proclamations for International Dark Sky Week. We're moving towards action. The last was share. We hope that you'll come back next year and share what you've been up to. And with that, um, the last thing I have to do is uh, welcome another of IDA's stellar board members uh, to introduce our last panel. Uh, based just outside Los Angeles, Mike is an amateur astronomer, but that's not why we invited him to participate in our board. Not content with looking at the stars, he set out to share them and inspire others to protect them. He co-chaired the 100 Hours of Astronomy project for the International League of Astronomy back in 2009, and he hasn't left his little laurel since then. He founded Astronomers Without Borders, which really is a global movement putting telescopes into the hands of people around the world. And his new ventures, again, are refocusing on the really critical aspect of providing equitable uh, access to the night sky through astronomy. Welcome, Mike. It's an honor to pass the bet on to you. Thanks for taking us forward. Uh, thank you, Ruskin, uh, for the nice introduction and the rundown of all the things that uh, I have to go back and, and watch uh, that I missed during this incredible conference. I don't know how you guys stay up 24 hours to, to, to manage this, but <clears throat> this is really a special one for me. Uh, I, I get the opportunity to hear, here to introduce two really amazing people uh, who who have their own perspectives on the issues that we face as far as earth and general light pollution in particular. <clears throat> so uh, first let's introduce uh, Nicole Stott. Now, Nicole is an astronaut, uh, retired now. Uh, they don't like to say former, she's still an astronaut because she's been there. She's also an artist. And uh, she did some, uh, and, and uh, Betty Mai, I think you have a couple of things that we can show here too as I go through it, but <clears throat> she is an engineer. She's an aquanaut. She has uh, done, done the first oil painting on space. Here she is taking a look at Earth from the, uh, the cupola, something that I still aspire to do, even though the chances seem to be going down by the day that I'll ever make it up there. Uh, I've been wanting to do that since the, since the days when they wore silver suits to go into space. And she paints the most amazing things about Earth from space like this, uh, showing, I think, more than you can do with a photograph alone. Uh, she's also... Um, this, this is the sort of thing that you don't really understand from the photographs. And I've been looking at photographs from space for 60 years and, and they just don't do this. She's also involved in many other aspects. Uh, I think we have here the um, spacesuit art project in the cupola. Uh, well, now we're skipping ahead. Oh. That shows us <laughs> all over the place here. This is a fantastic program in which uh, art is collected by children from around the world. In this case, cancer, uh, pediatric cancer patients in um, uh, the Anderson uh, Hospital, I think it is, uh, in Houston. And we have a picture then, I think we could show Betty Maya, that shows um, that spacesuit after it's put together actually being worn in space. Well, there it goes. Uh, this shows 
yeah, in the cupola there. I don't remember which one it is. Anyway, uh, we'll get to it sooner or later. She, there are so many great things that uh, that Nicole has done. So she brings a lot of perspective to um, the issues that we face in a broader perspective. She's also written a new book called Back to Earth. And I hope I got that right, Nicole, because mm -hmm. I don't have it in front of me. And about what it's like, what it's like to see Earth in a new light, having seen it from space. We also have another space traveler, Tim Russ, a longtime actor and a great musician. I, Tim, uh, I just re-listened to a recording of his and it became an earworm. I could not get out of my head for a couple of days. <laughs> a cover of, um, what is it? Uh, Lead Me Home, I think it was. <clears throat> yeah, a great jazz musician. Uh, he's traveled through space in a way that people have done for hundreds of years through fantasy and science fiction. He was Tuvok in Star Trek Voyager, a Vulcan. And uh, I, I noticed a comment go by. There's so many comments from around the world. This is fantastic. Carolyn in northern Minnesota said she was excited. She's She's a Star Trek Voyager fan and, and watched uh, just rewatched the whole series. And the reason that we have Tim here is not just because he's been out amongst the stars in, uh, in science fiction, but he's an amateur astronomer and he really does explore the stars as many of us do with his, this is his current love, his latest telescope, the Unistellar that he's done a lot of work with. And we've got some pictures that he has taken with this recently too. So uh, Tim ha definitely has a stake in what's happening there. Uh, he's using this telescope to help get around light pollution a bit. It helps, but uh, you know he he definitely would like to see the skies darker too. And he does a lot of outreach, public outreach, in astronomy as well. So welcome to both of you guys. Uh, it's just a delight to have both of you here to talk to. Nice so, to be here. <laughs> and uh, so we har I hardly recognize you without your space suits and ears and so on, but um, <laughs> I know Tim will get a, a lot of that. There are so many things to talk to you about, but you know, a couple of things I think you can both address uh, have to do with what it's like looking up into the sky, which we all do looking back towards earth, which a few of us get to do, but some of us do in pictures and looking out from the International Space Station. We, Nicole, when you're up there, we have some pictures that Betty Maya could bring up at any time in our relatively disorganized fashion here that shows the, the, the earth at night and the stars that are there and they're beautiful. But for people like Tim and me, uh, they're, they're not really a great thing. And what there, see, it's, it's just extraordinary. Tell us a little bit like viewing uh, the earth from, from space, the day night cycle, how this, it, it, we're not designed for this. It's gotta be a big problem for you to deal with. Well, I think, you know, where we are on the International Space Station, um, really not that far above earth quite honestly what about 250 300 miles above the planet and orbiting at um, a fairly good pace of 17,500 miles an hour which is about five miles a second so that means that we we orbit the planet um, 16 times a day every 90 minutes and every 45 minutes or so i love that betty maya put this picture up because Every 45 minutes or so, we get one of these stunning sunrises or sunsets out the window. And um, I mean, I, I kind of worried about it before flying, like, oh my gosh, how is this like, it's, you know, out the window every 45 minutes, it's day and night and, um, you know, going around the planet like this. But it just um, seems to become like a natural part of the day, even though there's 16 of each of these in a day. And and I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, we don't have ginormous windows in the space station. I mean, you, you kind of have to float to find one. And so it's not like it's going light day, you know, flashing inside of the station like that. 
um, throughout throughout the, the day either. Um, this picture shows absolutely, I think, the favorite place of all astronauts on the space station, which is an Earth facing, like it's kind of like a bay window. There's a, a big center circular window and then six windows that surround it. And so you really do get this um, gorgeous horizon, the horizon view of the planet. And um, I can tell you, if an astronaut has free time, that's where they're spending it is, um, you know, in that cupola or in front of some other window <laughs> in the station. And, and honestly, we're not um, real worried about whether it's day or night outside. We just want to capture, uh, kind of get it in our brains and then certainly use pictures to do so. For a picture like this, um, you're not just going to look out the window and see this. And it's kind of the same thing. There's that same like light pollution challenge that we have to deal with on the space station, uh, not just from the glow of the earth itself, but from lights inside the space station. And so if we want to take pictures like this, we have to um, get it really dark inside the station to do that. And we have to be very you know, sensitive with the way we use the camera to, um, you know, to capture that light that you're seeing in this picture. We do see it um, quite beautifully like this. But uh, this is a case where I think um, with night sky imagery like this, it's a case where the camera, because of its light sensitivity, actually does get a better view than what we can see with our own eyes. Um, but I think it's stunning. <laughs> and Absolutely. I highly recommend it to anyone who can get there to see it. I can take yeah. me with you. Yeah, I need to. People too. tell me that all the time because I go to places around the world and, and uh, that that's fine, but I want somebody like you to take me with you. Yeah. So Tim, uh, Tim, you know well the effect of the cameras and what we can do with cameras that you can't do with your eyes. Those pictures taken with the EV scope, if those were taken at your home or nearby in Los Angeles, those were not things that you could see with your naked eye. So, <clears throat> you know, I really, uh, I really want to know how you got into this. Is there any connection between roles that you had? Usually not. Uh, you've been in a couple of uh, a few space movies and so on, and uh, um, but you're you're an artist as well, and and into music and everything else. What got you into astronomy in the first place, and what does that mean to you, being able to see these things, both with your eyes and with the camera? Well, I uh, I began uh, the hobby of astronomy about thirty to thirty five years ago. Um, I had started working as an actor professionally at that time, and I was just interested in, in space science in general. Um, all of the sciences, the other fields of study as well, uh, in general that I've been interested in, but astronomy um, was something I could just go to the store, uh, pick up a decent telescope and actually participate in firsthand, you know, um, and, and it was easy at the time. There were several stores in Los Angeles I could just go and browse and talk to the people who were selling them to get the information on which might be the best one to start with. And, um, and, and I was able to find a very simple, you know, very uh, inexpensive telescope just to, just to get familiar with the sky. And back then we didn't have computerized telescopes available for the consumer, the average consumer. So everything was manual and um, you had to learn the night sky, which is what I did. Now, of course, living in Los Angeles, I had to go out to darker skies to be able to really participate in that and to, to be able to see enough of the constellations to know, to identify them. So um, I did that on my own mm -hmm. and uh, it took about, you know, maybe a, a, a summer or two to get really familiar with, you know, most of the constellations and objects. I was absolutely fascinated by it. Also be able, being able to see uh, the planets that are around every year uh, for a certain number of months and to be able to see the detail on them. And then, you know, starting from where I began with the, the very rudimentary, just sort of entry level telescope, I started to accumulate, of course, uh, bigger and bigger ones uh, that did uh, had more and different capabilities. And uh, the pinnacle of that is is the one that I have now, which is the uh, unistellar EV scope. And and I got to tell you that, uh, again, you know, we were talking about earlier about how Zoom has allowed us to do what we're doing today because it's technology that's come this far. Well, in astronomy, that telescope has actually opened up the opportunities to be able to participate in it in a way that I could not ever 
have done prior to this type of instrument coming out, you know, to battle, as it were, what we're talking about, which is light pollution. It's the night sky and this thing can cut right through it uh, in the middle of the city. Um, so very fortunate to have an opportunity to, uh, to use a telescope like that, that allows me in, in mere minutes to be able to look through the eyepiece and see these objects with the color and detail that I can see them in, which is impossible with an optical telescope in a city. And, uh, but ultimately uh, uh, the, uh, the television shows and science projects that I ended up working on in film and television were just coincidental. They came much later on. I didn't work on hardly any sci-fi at all at the beginning, but uh, it was much later on that I ended up doing these shows. So it's just a coincidence that it turned out the way it did. Of course, of course. And, and you know, my background is similar to yours, all of us amateur astronomers of a certain age, and I'm of a little bit more age than you are. We we had to do it ourselves and figure it out and uh, be very, very persistent. <clears throat> there are so many great uh, advantages to the technology that we have now, both in space and looking back up from Earth. Uh, I want to mention one other thing here. For those of you have, that who have questions for Tim or Nicole, uh, pop them into the Q&A there. And... Um, we don't promise to be able to ask them all, but we are going to leave time for questions and answers because there are a lot of good comments and questions coming from around the world. So Q&A on the Zoom app. So um, uh, the the uh, so getting into the space things, well, it's, it's, I was a sci-fi nut and always have been as well. Nicole, a lot of the astronauts are... Uh, are inspired by astronomy to begin with. And I know some who definitely started that way, others who uh, not so much. What about you? Is this Was the night sky a part of your life before? Did it, did it connect you with the space? Uh, I think it always was a part of my life. I never, um, I mean, I never delved into it the way that you and Tim have. I've oh, no, always we're obsessed. had a, no, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, 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 or investigated it that way. I was always in awe of it though. I think it's, I think it's interesting. I don't, I don't think it matters who you are, where you are, but when the stars like show up in the sky, I think everyone is in awe of that. And so, um, you know, that was certainly that way for me. I'm, you know, I have those memories of the night sky with the moon in it. And, you know, the, that first moon landing and you know even at you know seven years old I think you're uh you realize what an extraordinary thing that is it kind of lures you in and you know with this partner we have in space up there um but I think I grew you know grew over time to appreciate even more and in and I I have vivid memories of you know, like you're talking about having to learn, you know, learn the, the constellations, learn what you're looking at in the sky over, over, you know, the different times of year. I mean, as a kid and, you know, getting older, going to planetariums where there used to be the planetarium show with the guy with the laser, you know, showing, you know, arc to arc tourists and all of these kinds of things that like kind of stick in your head when you look in the sky. And those certainly I remember them flashing in my mind as I'm looking out the window of a spaceship too, and being able to, um, you know, try to find those, find those places in the night sky and being again in awe of just how, um, I, I think how much of a connection we have to all that, even as far out in space as it is, um, that like brings us all back to earth in a really um, kind of unifying way, this fact that we're living on a planet in space. And I will just throw out the, the, the sci-fi influence for me was absolutely Star Trek growing up. And, um, and I, I think it's, and so I'm so excited to have Tim here with us because I think even as the, the story of Star Trek kind of evolved with the different series and stuff too, it always, always has us traveling through space um recognizing that we're, i mean acknowledging that the that it's in space and have i mean just really helping us look towards a positive future right how we can you know how we manage the technology our relationships all those kinds of things it has us look towards a positive future and that's what i feel like 
we're doing on the space station with the way we live and work there. It's, it's about how do we work as this international community? It's more than just the technology and it's all about improving life on earth. Star Trek, if you really look at the heart of it, everything that was going on, all about improving life on earth. And I think that through shows like that, through that kind of inspiration, we're looking up and really better understanding who we all are in space together. And I know that's a long rambling answer to say, no, I didn't have a telescope as a kid, but I, I think there's an appreciation for that night sky and all different kinds of influences around us that is very positive. Well, that, that and your experience in space and coming back to earth has very clearly affected how you see the earth itself. Our connection with the sky is more than just seeing stars. It's more than just exploring space, either physically or as Tim and I do with uh, telescopes. It's really a part of our environment. And that's really what IDEA is about, the, uh, the dark skies. It <clears throat> is a part of our environment that affects many things. You're an aquanaut as well. It affects sea animals. It affects humans uh, uh, physiologically and so on and out as well. Um, and uh, it, this is all part of exploring and realizing that we're all together on this, on this one little planet. You know, Tim, uh, I, another aspect of this, and this was something in one of the breakout rooms that I was just in, was the uh, uh, sharing things, talking to the public. The concern there was how do we get people to understand the importance of light pollution, especially you, you don't miss the stars if you've never seen them, you know. And uh, also people just simply aren't aware of the importance of the DNI cycle and all of these other things that most of us and certainly the people here uh, <clears throat> know about. But, and, and, and you know, so one other person is wondering the same thing. We, we'll get to all the questions soon, but Niraj Dave asks, does Tim Russ go to dark sky parties? And my guess is yes, but also public star parties. You do attend to public star parties. What is the importance to you of sharing what it is that you're doing? I mean, I've done this my whole life, so I can answer for myself but of, of sharing what it is that you're doing with other people. What's the message? How does it affect them? How does it affect you to be sharing? Well, I'll tell you, I, you know, uh, I look forward to, and I really uh, try to open my schedule up to be available to do the dark sky parties, the public star parties we have here in Los Angeles. Um, COVID shut us down for about two years. Um, and we're just now, getting back to uh, allowing uh, the public to uh, share all of our telescopes with the Los Angeles Astronomical Society at the Griffith Observatory, which has a very large influx of tourists every single day almost. Um, and for us to be able to set up all our telescopes on the front lawn there and for people to line up, they are absolutely amazed at what they see through the telescope. And very often they look at me and say, well, wait, wait a minute, that's, is that, you sure that's not a picture? Of, of that and the eyepiece. And they are so stunned by the view of Saturn or Jupiter uh, or the moon and things like that. And then of course, with the EV scope, even more amazing deep sky objects, they are to stand there and to be able to speak to them about the things they're looking at and educate them. Uh, it does help a lot to open up that world to people, you know, uh, who are not familiar with astronomy. I mean, let's face it, if, if astronomy was as popular as soccer, football, or baseball, we wouldn't be having this conversation. The Earth would be pitch black as far as the skies go, you know, <laughs> if 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 it was that 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 popular, you know, worldwide. Um, astronomy is is a science, and uh, not everybody is is really into science. Um, it's a very specific sort of field of study and and interest, and um, you have to have the sort of the imagination and the and the and the uh, the vision to look beyond the, the the routine sort of normal everyday things that everybody is preoccupied with. Uh, to allow your imagination to flow. Science fiction and like I worked on and things like that and television shows and movies sort of help in that. But to actually see something through the eyepiece of a telescope and, 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 and wonder about how far that object is from Earth, how vast it is, how vast the universe is, you have to stop and think about that. And uh, generally people just, just don't on a daily basis do that. Um, it takes a specific kind of individual to to really stop and, 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 and wonder and imagine all of those things. So I think the more people um, are exposed to uh, that opportunity through the, 
public star parties and things, um, the better we are. And, and uh, I enjoy the public star parties uh, even more than just going to dark skies with, uh, with the group. And, you know, that's fine and great for me, but it's more interesting with the general public uh, to see the expression on their faces and to hear what they say when they look in the eyepiece. It's just, you can't get enough of it, man. It's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not unlike performing live in, for an audience and you get the feedback from the audience from the songs. It's almost the same kind of thing. Can I, can I add something, Mike, to that? Um, just comment, because I love the, the response, Tim. And I think I have like this memory of my mother-in-law um, on the Isle of Man, there is um, a wonderful observatory there. And it's, um, they have, I can't remember, it's like eight or nine like designated dark sky locations on this 300 square mile island. And it's, I mean, it's like, it's dark in a way that's like, put your hand in front of your face, you don't see your hand when they're, you know, when you're out of the, and they're only tiny little cities. So there, it's not, it's like a 300 square mile island with 80,000 people. And they're all kind of concentrated in a couple little areas. So most of the island is just so dark. And, um, and we're up at the observatory and um, it was her first time like, re like really looking through a telescope. And they had Saturn in view. And I, somewhere I have the picture of her, like you can almost feel her shaking. At, at looking at this image of Saturn in this telescope. And I just, I'm, I'm always like crying. Look, I'm like, oh my gosh, she's so, it's like, that was total all wonder wrapped up in this one view of, she's like, oh my gosh, it looks like what they tell you it's gonna, it looks like, you know, just like, yeah, and see the, you know, it, it was so cool to, to witness that experience that she had. And I tell you, I feel a little bit every time I look through a telescope now or, you know, or look up at the night sky and know that Saturn and just kind of reflecting on her reaction to it. And the same kind of thing I think happens, you know, I'll be in my, my on my neighborhood street and it'll be one of those nights where um, the space station is flying over, you know, where you know that it's going to fly over. And there'll be somebody walking their dog or something. We'll be looking up and be like, oh, what are you looking at? Like, oh, that's the International Space Station. And they're like, what, what, what? You know, they don't even know there is an International Space Station. <laughs> and then, you know, you're like, yeah, look at it. You know, it'll be five minutes of it moving across the sky. And it's probably, oh yeah, and think about it. There's like, it's been up there for over 20 years. There's seven people living up there representing these different countries. And oh, by the way, you can put this app on your phone and put your zip code in and know, you know, when the station's going to fly over. And oh my gosh, they look at you like you're, <laughs> there's something like, really? I don't, you know, they almost don't believe you. And I, I, I see it happening in both of those kinds of things. And I think it opens up, you know, for people who might not have looked up and appreciated or might not have known there's a space station and what's going on there that's all about improving life on earth. And or looked at the sky and thought, oh my gosh, I live on a planet in space. I mean, that's a pretty compelling thing to think about, right? Yes. And, um, and I love it. They walk away and you know they're getting that app on their phone or you know they're thinking about Saturn again if they look through that telescope. And, and I think it then opens up, um, it opens up the, for them for the, the possibilities of awe and wonder around them in so many different ways too. Like now they will look up at the night sky, but I think they're probably looking around themselves just in general a little bit different as well. Yeah, let, let there be a major power failure in Los Angeles and then see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All these lights go away. People are going to be absolutely stunned. They'll all be in their front yard looking up at that point, you know. And that did happen after the Northridge earthquake and people were calling the police in the observatory and saying there was something funny, something wrong with the sky because it wasn't uh, done yet because there was some some light up there and they it you know they were all afraid of, they'd never heard of it before but this is this is the kind of discussion and I can see people are going nuts in the comments as well because there are a lot of outreach astronomers here. <laughs> I can see that. And this is all one and the same thing. Uh, I, so I worked at Griffith Observatory over 40 years ago, running the 12 inch uh, Zeiss refractor up there, Tim. And I spent some time down on the lawn as well. Yep. And uh, spent a lot of time doing outreach over the years. And why do you do it? it it's like 
looking at Saturn for the first time through somebody else's eyes. And sure. that is something that's incredible. There are lives that are changed by that. This is awe. Ron Garen, Nicole's good friend, says it's awe and wonder. This is what that's about. The overview effect um, of looking at the uh, Earth from space and how that changes your, your view of space, which Nicole knows well. Uh, uh, a good uh, description of which was uh, William Shatner being unable to speak and sobbing virtually coming back after seeing this. And for us to astronomy is the overview effect for the rest of us. And I don't say this lightly because I'm involved with Frank White, who you know, Nicole and the Overview Institute and so on. It is how we do this. And uh, it is the same for places around the world as well. But that sense of awe and wonder is more than just looking at it and say, well, that's neat. It is people who then step back from the telescope and you say, well, you mean that bright thing there? That's Jupiter? And from then on, they're like citizens of the universe. You know, They, they know what they're looking at. It means something to them. Um, the stars are critically important to us culturally and in many other ways. And it's why one of the many reasons why it's so important for us all too. So, and I wanna say that many people have asked a question about what it's like to look at the stars from the ISS. This is something I wondered about for 40 years, 50 years. Uh, if there is still a recording online of the closing panel, from last year's meeting with John Grunsfeld and Ron Guerin. John is an astrophysicist. He spent a lot of time up there. He would hold star parties in the darkest place of ISS. And this, the, the short answer is, yeah, they're brighter from up there. And you wanna hear more, John will tell you about it. Go find that recording. So, <clears throat> um, I mean, you you guys, you've covered so much. And one of the things is, too, that we know when we're talking to other people, when we're looking at what is lost by the light and so on, that this is an important thing. It is not since the space age that this, this happened. I just want to give you a quote here. You will not believe who said this. Humanity must rise above the earth to the top of the atmosphere and beyond. For only then will we understand the world in which we live. This did not come from Frank White or Robert Goddard. It was Socrates 2,000 years ago. This is not a new idea. They knew looking up at the sky that uh, this place was special. I mean, we really wouldn't know it until we got out there. And, uh, you know, Nicole, you've told us about this, Tim. It, you don't write the stories, or you could have on Star Trek, but uh, because some do. But in a way, you're giving us a view of Earth also in the in the roles that you've played from outside you know, under different circumstances. And so, does that ever occur to you when you're playing a Vulcan that you're you're bringing a different perspective of humanity and Earth? Or is it more just reading the lines? I mean, you have a different perspective, too, as an amateur astronomer. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I was working on the show, um, uh, it was you know it's 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 work. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a job. I mean, working a single camera um, on any show, regardless of whether it's a space or a cop show or a lawyer show, they're all the same. They work and function the same. And you're just wearing a different costume, and you're doing yes, you're doing different dialogue and things like that. You're what you know i think harking back to what nicole said for me it was about the stories and how they they bring into focus how uh, the future might be for us to live together for me it was more of a an effect on, on on stories that bring to light the conflicts and how we resolve conflicts and how we work together on this planet um and and the one thing that i am sort of uh, i've been sort of i don't know i'm gonna say wrestling with but sort of it's been plaguing me or haunting me. I should say the word is haunting me recently is that, you know, I've checked a couple of times and I've read up a couple of times on what the astrophysicists estimation, uh, what the estimations are of there being other intelligent life in our galaxy. 
-hmm. given the size of the galaxy, the number of stars, and exponentially the number of planets, it's really small. It's a very small number. It is frighteningly small. I mean, ridiculously small. If that's the case, then we're damn near by ourselves. We're almost alone. I mean, seriously, I'm, I'm I get a SETI, all SETI uh, search for intelligent life aside, their estimate is minuscule for intelligent life similar to ours. Okay, not talking about moss and lichen growing on a rock. I'm talking about intelligent life, being able to reach out, being able to communicate and build a civilization. We're almost alone, statistically, based on what their estimations are. They may be wrong, but I have to put it in the field of, 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 of their expertise. I have to hand it to them in, in terms of what they uh, you know, estimate, in terms of the odds and the variables that are involved in us being here. It, it is a miracle that we're here. Just from the statistics, it is an absolute miracle of how many things could go wrong. This is what, to me, is most important. Um, and, I, and Nicole, from her perspective, I'm, I have to imagine you probably, looking back on Earth, had to feel something similar to that. It is, this is a gem. This is a pearl. This is uh, something that is so rare. Uh, we are so fortunate to have you know, this opportunity to be here um, as, as an intelligent species. In this, in this, just in the galaxy alone, hell, just in our neighborhood alone, uh, uh, in the universe, it's 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 an absolute miracle. So to me, it's astronomy has taken on even another sort of level of importance um, in terms of looking up at the sky and imagining how far things are and how vast the universe is. Just wondering how, you know, how many other intelligent species might be looking back at in our part of the of the galaxy and wondering who's there and what's there. Uh, given that there may not be that many, so yeah, Nicole, well, you've you've seen Earth from above and below. There are some questions like that, and I'm sorry, everybody. So many good questions. I wish this could be four hours. I would do it. I don't think anybody else would, <laughs> but I'm trying to touch on the things that are the general themes of it. So I apologize to those that we we don't get to. But Nicole, you've seen Earth from above and below, and uh, and, and there's one other thing too that I want to mention that, uh, and I don't know if it's relevant to this, that picture, for example, of the sunset or sunrise, it's a photograph of the earth's atmosphere, but I've seen your painting of that and it doesn't look the same. It looks better. <laughs> and because it clearly is painted from your perspective, this is the value of art in that you're not, it's not just data. It's the it's the human aspect of it, and both of you guys are artists. So what so what do you think about what what Tim had to say? And does it, the the looking back at Earth traveling into space and and under the ocean what, does that affect your perspective on this? Oh my gosh, absolutely. And I I think that um, I mean I remember before we go into space and you know through the years of training and getting ready to do it and all of that and hearing other people talk about their experience as well and um and listening to you know some of the early guys like the Apollo guys too and and a lot of times I would hear um I don't know I would hear like words like insignificant used and, you know, insignificant in the grand scheme of the universe kind of thing. And I remember really being like, oh my gosh, I hope what they really mean is they were humble. They were in awe of what they were seeing, you know, actually getting to see the whole planet, you know, I guess on a relatively small scale from, you know, from that vantage point of space. And um, I was so happy when, first of all, when I got to talk to those guys and discovered that, that they didn't mean anything negative at all, right? They didn't mean insignificant in a bad way. They really were, I mean, it was more a size thing that they were referring to. And, um, and then to get to space and see earth from space, um, you know, and we didn't get from the station, we don't get that whole planet view. We get kind of this horizon to horizon of the, of the earth expanding below us. But just being like, from the very first second, like, oh my gosh, total significance. <laughs> there was no, I mean, there was no denying. It's like, first of all, that reality of, wow, we live on a planet, you know? I mean, I, I don't, 
astronomers might think about that every day, but I don't think everyone really considers the significance, the like compelling significance of us living on a planet in space, right? Our, our spaceship, but you're like purpose built, however, to, to support our life. And, you know, a little closer, a little further from the sun, not so good for us, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just these little subtle things like like Tim, like you were saying, like the miracle of that, this place being where it is to support our life. And I think that's in your face every day when you're in space, floating by, looking at you're surprised every time you look out the window. It's um, this glowing, colorful, iridescent, translucent. I mean, all of those things, all those colors we think of Earth being, it's you're seeing it out that window. And and I think that, um, you know, you know, you talk about Ron, John, some of these other folks that we know well and have communicated some of the same kind of stuff. It's like, there's, there's this sense of connection to this place that, you know, you sometimes just don't get when you're right down in the middle of it, when it's kind of around you instead of when you're surrounding it. And um, this ultimate sense of interconnectivity and um, the real significance of who and where we are in space together. And I think speaking to that whole, you know, the whole underlying theme of a story like Star Trek too, and sci-fi in so many ways, um, good sci-fi, I think is that, it, I mean, it really, like if we behave like crewmates, not passengers, I mean, we really do have the power to create a future for all life on earth that's as beautiful as it looks from space. And it seems so simple. I live on a planet, I need to behave like crew. And how much better it would be if we all did that. It's kind of like throwing that awe and wonder factor in for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, Gene Rodbury said that uh, Star Trek initially was wagon train to the stars. Not everybody here is old enough to know what wagon train was, but it was really just a microcosm. Take a bunch of people, who for various reasons want to leave everything behind and travel across unknown dangerous territory to get to a new place. It's science fiction on the surface of the earth. It's Star Trek and all of the other things. And this is something that we uh, is important for humans to have these stories and to think about the ways in which we explore. And, and it tells us what we learn from that, what home means what it means to be human you mentioned nicole that um we know intellectually we live on a planet we know it's round <clears throat> people have known that for thousands of years this was not something columbus discovered he knew he wasn't going to fall off the edge of the earth uh it was it was known by the ancient greeks um but people don't feel that that's it takes an experience for that to happen and that's the the idea that that we're all one on spaceship earth and that's where i think both astronomy and space travel can bring that feeling although it's a whole lot more in your face when you get off the earth i'm I, i'm pretty sure so um but yeah mike you know i don't know i don't know if you guys do this um I do it every day now. And I'll admit, I didn't do it before flying to space, but I'd like people to know that you don't have to fly to space to, to, to do this, to think about living on a planet, right? I mean, there's not a day goes by now where I don't walk outside in the morning, stand there in the dirt with my bare feet and just think about in a very kind of meditative way, yes, but um, think about, and I don't think you have to meditate to do this either. Just, oh my gosh, my feet are on a planet you know, look up at the sky, um, see the blue sky that seems to go on forever and just think about, wow, that's, the, it seems to go on for, but that is a veil thin line of blue around the planet, right? And oh my gosh, my feet are on this planet and we're spinning at a thousand miles an hour. <laughs> and I can't ever remember the number if it's 37 or 67,000 miles an hour that we're traveling around the sun, but and yet we just, it just feels like at home, the word you used, Mike, it just feels like this is the place we're supposed to be. And I think it, because it does such a good job at it, even though we keep threatening it, <laughs> it does such a good job at it that we don't, we don't think about these other things. Like my feet are on a planet. I'm spinning at a thousand miles an hour. We, we just don't even consider it. And I really 
gosh, if I could encourage everybody just every day, just think about, man, I'm on a planet in space. It, 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 it impacts the way you make decisions and how you live your life. I, I, I know really Tim believe it. Has, I know yeah. Tim has something to say about that. Yeah, that, and that's exactly what I was alluding to earlier when I was talking about the fact that, you know, when you stop it, you have to stop and think about, you know, whenever you can, um, about how important it is uh, that we're here because number one it is a, such a rare thing that we're here at all and and the fact that we are, we are circling around the sun and a solar system and circling an entire galaxy around a giant black hole uh, with you know a hundred thousand light years across of stars and and things and <laughs> I mean it's when you when you stop and think about it it is abs I'm sorry it's to me, it's a lot more, uh, uh, you know, important and much bigger in picture and scope than, I don't know, a football game. I don't, it just, it's just, it's, it's very, very important to just stop and, and, and take that beat and that moment to, you know, to imagine about all this stuff, not just watching a science fiction movie about it, but, you know, literally like she, like Nicole said, I mean, think about when you walk outside and you have the sun that's very stable and 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 there for us and and uh, we're lucky enough to be in the right goldilocks zone to have life on this planet man that is rare you know um just last week i think it was they spotted three asteroids coming out from behind the sun and one of them was real big and if those had been on a collision course with us we uh we would only have a few months left um uh, because those things can happen uh, between comets and asteroids that can come out from behind the sun, and that's the end of us. So warp there, drive, we, baby, need the warp, warp drive. drive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We we have to be around long enough to get <laughs> there, to have it, so we could you know skedaddle. But you know, it, until we are able to fend those things off, which they're working on, um, and eventually we will. Um, until we reach that point when we can get to, you know, almost a class one civilization, we might be able to ensure our, you know, our longevity on this planet. But until then, I you know it's, it's a touch and go thing. Uh, statistically, we're, the odds are in our favor, but it can happen. So, you know, and it has in the past. So, you know, we have to appreciate how rare uh, our existence here is in this solar system and in this universe, how rare things are here. And that's uh, certainly, we've learned more about that since the beginning of space travel and from people like Nicole who share this, but we have been imagining it, traveling through space for hundreds of years through sci-fi. And <clears throat> then there's the, the, the whole question in the space community about, are we gonna be like Star Trek or the Expanse? Uh, and is it gonna be, uh, are we gonna end up, you know, messing up everything else we go to we got to fix things here first, I think. And we're not doing a great job with the earth right now. You know, Todd put in something I was going to add to this. He put in a comment. If you want to feel like you're on a planet, go outside at sunset and look east. When I, and I do this purposely, I don't see the sun going down. I see the earth coming up. I, I I feel the horizon is us moving. It's not the sky moving. And you can just... Oh, that's what it is. Um, also looking at the planets. And I don't know if you do this, Tim, but you know what which planet is which. So you can look out when you have three or four planets in the evening sky, you know what the actual distance to them is. So you see it in 3D. You can see the solar system in 3D that way. There are a lot of ways that we can experience uh, these things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. <clears throat> But I well, think and what I love about, well, what you just said, um, Mike, about fixing things here is that um, by the way we're going to space, the way we've been living and working in space, the, you know, I think the number I saw um, last year when I was getting ready to head off to COP26 was that over 75% of the data we need to first of all, understand, like, like the vital signs of Earth, like measuring the vital signs of our planet, right? Over 75% of that data is coming to us through, through space resources. And, you know, that the exploration of space, and I think that is everything from, you know, the me, who is not, I wouldn't even count myself as an, an amateur astronomer, but me 
put my face, you know, my eye into a piece to look up at the night sky to all of the resources we have in space now and the exploration we're going to continue to do is ultimately about improving life on earth, not escaping it, not abandoning our problems here, but absolutely. And again, I go to the Star Trek future. I mean, every single, you know, Star Trek story still includes earth as this almost like, you know, becoming this paradise of where we want want to live you know it's not just surviving it's thriving it's not the expanse future it's it's continuing to look back at what our original home is and um and what we're doing in space is about expanding ourselves into that place because at some point that sun's not going to be stable right and we'll need that warp drive and interstellar um <laughs> travel for humanity to survive so um i think we really need to just look at it in you know from that sense of what we do in space is about improving life on earth. And, and those are the steps we take forward in that, with that mission in mind versus abandoning or, um, you know, stepping away from it. True, true. If we, if we can't get it right here, we're not gonna get it right at the next place. Well, and Mars, you know, the moon and Mars, they're not welcoming us, right? They are not garden paradises. They weren't put in that place. From the sun. No. And yeah. so we basically are going to have to turn them into our spaceships in order to be able to survive there. So again, we're going to have to do the best we can to mimic what Earth does for us naturally in such a beautiful way. Well, I am being told by Betty Maya that we are out of time. And I'm being told by other people to just keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> and and my natural inclination as as a hundred percent rebel is to just keep going, and they can cut us off if they want to. But um, <laughs> I suppose I have to be responsible, a responsible adult once in a while, which my wife doesn't think I'm capable of being. Uh, but this has been just really awesome. I mean, I I I love hanging out with you guys. Uh, so much insight and experience. And so much of it relevant to what we're doing here. And I hope that this was inspiring to those out there who are advocating for taking care of our spaceship Earth. Light pollution is an important part of that. It's not just about, you know, I want to be able to see the stars from my home. Uh, it's, it's so much more than that. And the IDA, I'm on the board of IDA because it's a super important cause. And it needs to be more in the mainstream. And I believe Kelly is going to come on and tell us more about it because I see a little Kelly up in the corner of my screen here. <laughs> so I want to thank you both. Let me, okay, Kelly, I'm going to take just a moment to give Nicole and Tim a chance to say what's next, where should we, what should we look for next? Uh, Nicole with the Space for Art Foundation is important to you. Anything else you want to mention? Are you appearing to the casino in her? <laughs> uh, I, I encourage people to check out Space for Art Foundation. You see one of the darkening, it's, it's dark here in Florida, um, suits in the back here. Check it out and, and the work we're doing. Um, and, and I just, I, you know, I want to I wanna throw a shout out. I don't know if this is allowed. I'm going to shout out to yes. my friend Howard Parkin, who I think is part of your organization um, and a wonderful astronomer from the Isle of Man who wrote this amazing book called Space for Dark Skies. And, um, and on his behalf, I would, I would invite you, please, if you can visit the Isle of Man, you will be, you will be in awe of the kind of dark sky you can experience there. Um, UNESCO, only country designated as a UNESCO biosphere, and I think at least eight or nine designated dark sky locations on the island. And oh my gosh, I, I really am so thankful to the people that live there who believe as, as all of you do, that it is really important to protect that as part of the and, culture and just what the Isle of Man is all about. So and, find yourself in the middle of the Irish Sea, be sure to visit there. And your book, Nicole. Oh yeah, Back to Earth. Yeah, don't forget about that. Back to Earth. <laughs> please, to, please, I, um, you know, if, if, if you find it. I'm embarrassed to say I haven't read it yet, Nicole, because I haven't had a chance to read anything, but everybody I know is involved in space in any way says it's the best so i'm getting there well, Tim, what about you? you you music uh, astronomy uh stage and screen well i uh you know, i'm constantly working uh on projects whether they're my own or whether i get uh hired to work on them um i just finished uh, finishing up a voiceover project for a video game and also working with the boston science museum 
um, mm. and, and putting out uh, a series of four short video clips about um, objects that are being viewed by the Webb telescope um, and also some of the objects that I've been viewing with my telescope. Uh, certain points in astronomy, they wanna release about four of these short sort of video clips. They're like a TikTok style video clips for their social media program at the Boston Science Museum. So I'm gonna be producing about four of those per month coming up here in the next couple of months and um, also working with them on a video game, uh, doing voiceover work for a mission to Mars video game that they're also going to be putting together, which is fascinating. It's really well, well written and well done where you participate in a Mars mission. You have to go out and collect samples and, and work and you have, to, you, have to, you have to build your rover. You have to design your rover and get all the right parts and pieces and you go out and you collect lab samples to bring back to be studied and things like that. So I'm doing a voiceover uh, work for them for the video game as you know, playing one of the roles of the AI and also the commander of the station. So doing that as well. And I wanna say for those who are beginning astronomy, um, I continue to, if you have a chance to ever to, to join and come to a public star party, those out there who have not done it yet, please do, because it's a really good opportunity to, to, to look through a, a variety of telescopes and see a lot of different things naked eye. And also, if you're starting to, if you want to start uh, the hobby of astronomy, there's a very good book. Um, I wrote the foreword for it. It's called 110 Things to See with a Telescope. And I posted it in the chat as well. Uh, it's a very good book for beginning astronomy, just learning the basics. Uh, to help you through it. So, uh, yeah. Fantastic stuff, Tim. You guys are just amazing. And, and Nicole, I think I mentioned in an email, I have a project I want to talk to you about. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and both of you guys, uh, I, I have to talk to you about something else. I won't, I, I won't do it here. Uh, Kelly, I'm going to throw in just a real quick thing for me, because my latest thing is Astronomy for Equity. We're doing Astronomy for the Blind. Uh, we just raised telescopes for amazing uh, organization with astronomy clubs in middle schools across Libya. There are other things going on for developing countries using astronomy for good. We can't do astronomy if we can't see the stars, can we? So it's all it's all tied in. So Ruskin gave me a good intro there. Kelly, we worked together for a long time. If anybody is interested in that. It's astro, the number four, equity.org. We're a startup. If you have money, um, we want some. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that, Mike. Uh, old, old buddy, uh, it's been too long. We need to get together. And Nicole, Tim, thank you so very much. Tim, I invite you both out to Boston. Tim, if you get out here, we're going to put you to work at a star party. Nicole, if you get out here, we're going to put we're going to put a telescope in front of you and show yes, you please. some amazing stuff. Okay. <laughs> That's, let's make a pact there. Um, it's been great having you. This has been so uh, invigorating, and I, I wish we had more time, but we don't. So, uh, all you know, we have right now online 150 plus attendees. Uh, we've had more than 600 come over the course of this 24-hour uh, marathon. Um, I, I know Ruskin thanked the IDA staff. I would like to also thank the IDA staff. Thank all of you for joining us and. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's it's a lot of work to put this on, and Ruskin uh, alluded to that. Uh, one of the things, so your next question is probably going to be, okay, I'm so enthused now, what can I do? And I want to just iterate here that uh, you might seem like you're on your own wherever you are, but there is this whole network of people, as you've discovered over these 24 hours and there are plenty of next steps that you can do. The first is, as you see here, you could become a dark sky advocate. Uh, this is the program that Betty Meyer runs. She has a, a, this amazing assortment of uh, basically tutorials on how to be better, how to learn what lighting is and, and where the problems are and, and how to make a difference in, in the, uh, the people that you deal with. So that's one way to do it. Another is to just be, become you know, keep in touch with us via email. You see the QR code there. Uh, darksky.org is the website of the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, just uh, drop a, a message in there and, and we'll get back to you. And of course, we would love for all of you, uh, if you haven't already, to join the IDA. Here's the thing that I don't think people realize. We are the world leader in fighting light pollution. 
and we cast a long shadow. We are involved and influencing at all levels, and yet we have a staff of 10 or roughly 10, if that. Uh, we would, there are so many places that we would like to be engaged that we can't because we just don't have the bodies. Becoming a member of the IDA helps us fund programs that let us do more work, let us do more good. So I encourage you to join the IDA if you haven't already. And then looking ahead to next spring, we have International Dark Sky Week, started about uh, 15 or 20 years ago by a high school student, grown to become a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, along with, it, you can see the dates there next April. Uh, it coincides with the dark of the moon and nearly coincides with an eclipse of the sun uh, that's taking place uh, in Australia. Uh, so, so get involved in International Dark Sky Week. Work within your communities to come up with a program, something you can do. Um, and so, it also. I, I, if we can get away from the uh, the the slide, I want to show you this amazing T-shirt that is the conference T-shirt uh, uh, that uh, that I'm wearing. It's under one sky. You can see it here on the back. I won't show you. It's got uh, you know. Uh, remember the night sky. Welcome. Be part of the night sky in like five different languages. And I think Betty Maya is putting it in the in the chat. The link to how you order one of these T-shirts. The proceeds, of course benefit IDA. But I do hope those of you who have been here and not become members yet, please do consider becoming members. It is such vital work that I and the other volunteers around the world are doing. Let's all go in this together and remember that that you might be one voice where you are, but we are all in this together and we will make a difference. And with that, I'd like to bring this global conference to a close. I want to thank you all for attending. Um, and, and, you know, just a reminder that all of these will be, uh, all of the sessions will be posted online on YouTube. You'll get a link for that. So we'll see you next year. This time next year, I want to hear about all the things that you've accomplished between now and then. Thanks for joining us. Good night.